So thanks, Axel and Jill, for uh, putting the paper on the program. So this is a collaboration with uh, applied microeconomists, including Paul, who's on the call, um, and which came about because we uh, realized we had a shared interest in understanding the large amount of uh, debt relief that there was during the Great Recession and its macro implications. Um, and so let me uh, provide the motivation for the paper. The motivation is that um, household debt uh, is widely viewed as being central um, to the employment performance in the United States uh, um, in the Great Recession. Um, the standard macro story is that there was a decline in housing values and or a contraction in credit supply that led uh, to a reduction in consumption um, that monetary policy was unable to stabilize and that what, uh, that's in large part what um, generated the recession. Right? Um, now, an implication of that standard narrative uh, is that household debt forgiveness could have helped. Right? And um, in fact, there was a lot of proposals uh, during uh, the Great Recession, which we're seeing resurfacing now, uh, related uh, to um, ideas of writing down consumer debt in order to increase uh, spending and uh, employment. Um, and, um, and, and, and so those are influential policy proposals that we want a framework to be able to evaluate. Uh, but to evaluate those kinds of proposals, we need some idea of the extent to which uh, consumer debt forgiveness, in fact, can help uh, spending and employment. And, um, the starting point for, for this paper is that there was, in fact, a substantial amount of debt forgiveness during the Great Recession. If you're looking at the aggregate numbers, uh, there was something like a 1% of GDP written off by banks in every single year, uh, which in, in, in every year during the recession, which is about as much as was transferred uh, in UI payments uh, during the recession. Right? So large transfers uh, by uh, uh, the consumer bankruptcy system uh, and uh, more generally by uh, write-ups on consumer credit. Uh, of course, we can't use this alone in the time series uh, to estimate the aggregate effect of debt relief uh, because consumer write-downs went up exactly when employment was going down. Um, and so we turn to the cross-sections. The idea of the paper is we are going to turn to the cross-section of states uh, in order to uh, make progress on the question. We're going to exploit cross-state variation in uh, debtor protections uh, to measure debt forgiveness, um, and then we'll use the general equilibrium model to interpret the estimates that we provide as well as the aggregate implications. So more precisely what we do is, uh, the paper is written in three parts. Uh, the first thing is that we're going to just document uh, the cross-state effect of bankruptcy exemptions, which is our source of variation. We're going to show there was, there's a borrower response. So in more generous states, uh, there was, in fact, a, a more charge-offs, uh, significantly more charge-offs. Um, and then there was a macro effect, uh, which is that in those more generous states, we also saw higher employment uh, uh, in non-tradable sectors. Uh, and we'll see limited or no effect on, on the tradable sector. Next, what, what we do is we use these estimates to calculate what we call a cross-state debt relief employment multiplier. Um, which is kind of a summary of the causal effect uh, in the data that we can contrast with a model counterpart. And the key about this, as in standard cross-sectional work, is that it differences out its important general equilibrium effects. Uh, and so in interpreting this, uh, we are going to turn to a general equilibrium model to think about the types of uh, effects that are differenced out. Um, and so the general equilibrium model that we write down is a, a particular uh, heterogeneous agent model. It's a tank cube model for uh, two agents, uh, two goods, um, and two regions. Um, so a new Keynesian model uh, with this kind of heterogeneity. Um, and in the model, we'll interpret the charge-offs that we see in the data as a wealth transfer uh, from savers to borrowers. Um, that's going to be expansionary uh, because borrowers have higher marginal propensities to consume. Uh, and then uh, we'll see the implications of the model for tradable and non-tradable employment and contrast that with what we observing the data. And uh, the main objective of the model is to be able to recover what we call the missing intercept, uh, which is the effect of employment in the control states, what's being differenced out by the regression. And so in terms of where the paper fits, the paper fits broadly into three literatures. One is a literature that has uh, thought about the employment performance in the US after the Great Recession and the, the role of household debt. Uh, and here we contribute by 
pointing out that there might have been some role uh, for the consumer bankruptcy system in, in ameliorating outcomes. Um, there's a literature on uh, going from micro to macro uh, using uh, currency union models like the one we have, uh, typically thinking more about fiscal multipliers. And here we are thinking about this alternative policy, which is transfers from uh, savers to borrowers. Uh, and then we fit into this really, really large literature, which um, uh, you know this conference is about on uh, bankruptcy at household credit. And there's been a lot of focus in this literature on credit supply effects, uh, which we're going to have uh, very little to say about. Right. So a lot of what we document today is going to be the exposed effects on spending and employment. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the the extent to which the credit supply effects are different out and how we might uh, go about and making progress. Um, but the, um, the main way in which you, one can make progress in this literature is, um, is using a structural model. And I actually have a separate paper with Kurt Pittman, which is a, a structural uh, 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 model um, of the type that's typically written in this literature uh, to think both about the exposed effect and the ex-ante effect. OK, so let me provide some background for what we do um, and, and, and tell you a bit about the data. Um, so the, the source of variation we're using is variation in bankruptcy protections in the United States. So the laws uh, that vary across states are those bankruptcy asset exemption laws. And what those laws do is that they are protecting debtors' assets uh, from seizure by unsecured creditors. And so there's a wide range of assets that are in fact in, in practice protect, protect, protected, um, but the most important and the one that we'll focus on today is the homestead exemption. So the way to think about this is that homeowners that have positive uh, home equity uh, benefit more in high exemption states uh, because their home equity is being protected. So if you have positive home equity and unsecured debt, uh, it is um, um, easier um, for you to, to go bankrupt and get your debt discharged. Um, and, um, and therefore, um, you're more likely to go through with it either with bankruptcy itself or with a threat of going bankrupt uh, that might lead you to um, convince the lender to reduce your unsecured debt. The, these laws... So, so, are, so, so then it means that these assets are not usable as collateral. Right? Absolutely. And I mean, the, 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 that's, that's why I'm talking about unsecured debt and you know, bankruptcy is, is about discharging unsecured debt. So the these assets might be used as collateral for, say, uh, a secured loan, uh, uh -huh. and um, and and that's that's a whole uh, different part of the uh, of consumer of, of credit, right? So here we're thinking about unsecured debt. So think, say, credit card debt, which uh -huh. um, is not being directly secured by any asset that you have, and and but in principle, uh, um, say, if you have some positive home equity in states that have low exemptions, um, your uh, creditor might um, uh, be entitled to go after your home equity. And so the extent to which they're able to do this depends on the, um, the law in place. And so the extent to which there is the, the, the bankruptcy exemption in the state. And so I'll, I'll show you some examples. There's a lot of variation in, in, the, um, in the extent of these exemptions. And so I'll, I'll provide an, uh, an example in a second to be more concrete. Um, but in terms of uh, thinking about where these laws came from, so those laws were set uh, way, way back um, in, in prior to the crisis. And most of the changes since they were initially introduced uh, were inflation adjustments. Right? So the, 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 the literature has uh, done this before. We're not the first ones to, to use this um, to argue that those laws are, 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 are exogenous. Um, and there is in particular no significant correlation that we can see uh, with macro outcomes before the crisis. So we're going to argue that they're useful um, as a way to proxy for um, uh, the, 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 the amount of unsecured debt relief that there was. Okay, so as I said, we're going to focus on homestead exemptions uh, today. Um, in the paper, uh, we also construct a, a simulated instrument ma measure uh, that uses uh, more exemptions, um, and um, uh, but, but but in order to kind of really clearly see what's going on, I'm just going to focus on homestead exemptions. That's most of our variation. Um, so for regressions, we're going to standardize this measure, take the log. Um, but um, right now, let's just think about the level. Right? And so this is illustrating uh, to Jill's question the, the the level of exemption in the United States. So 
the, the level of exemptions varies from uh, states like Maryland that have zero uh, to states uh, like Texas and Florida that have infinite exemptions uh, for, home equ for, for home equity. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that if you're a consumer um, that has, say, $50,000 of home equity and $20,000 in unsecured credit, um, and you live in Illinois, uh, which has a $30,000 exemption, then your unsecured creditors can go after your home equity. Um, but if you live in California, which has $75,000 of exemptions, uh, then your home equity is entirely protected. Right? And so if you, went, if you were to go bankrupt, um, the unsecured creditors wouldn't be able to go after that. And so what that means in practice is um, the bargaining position for debtors is better. Um, and so, uh, they uh, might be able to obtain discharge of their unsecured debt, even if they don't go bankrupt in practice. And as Stefania was saying, there's a lot of, uh, um, and, and documented in her pr previous paper, there's a lot of default that's not via the, con the formal consumer bankruptcy system. And so this is an example in which the, the law itself, the, for the, the consumer bankruptcy law, is interacting with the extent of unsecured default that there might be otherwise. Um, because um, of the, these implicit threats that, um, that, that consumers can make. Okay, so this is, this is how... Um, so, the, Adrian, can, can I ask yeah. you a quick question about that? Yeah, so, these, uh, these exemptions don't depend on the on other characteristics, like suppose you, have a, you are married or single, and you have uh, kids uh, or stuff like that, some other mm -hmm. source of heterogeneity? They, no, so I, can, I can, they do. Yeah, Paul, Paul can jump in on this. Yeah, sorry. They, uh, 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 just to answer, yes, they do. Married versus single is the big one that uh, which you were, I think, aware of. And in this, what we're plotting here is we're just using the um, we're using the married exemption. We're not sort of the variation is going to matter in terms of ordering them, but to keep it consistent across the states, this here and what we're using is we're going to be using the married exemption. Is there a different demographic you had in mind? Oh, and, uh, I think it also about the kind of heterogeneities across uh, regions inside the states also because you can say in the suburban areas, uh, families, uh, married families, uh, uh, there could be many kind of uh, effects even inside the states, right? That's right. Uh, so yeah. That, that's, yeah, so we're trying to think about cross-state variation. So we're, I'm, I was sort of holding a fix, but it's true to think about, be interesting to think about the interaction between that dimension. Um, and that's something we should look at. That's a good suggestion, thanks. Can I ask how housing equity is assessed and whether there's any reason to believe that there is systematic variation in that across states? Um, I'm happy to, uh, I, I, Adrian, unless you, I'm happy to answer that. So- I'll let you answer it. Um, it depends on sort of what the context is, is the short answer. Um, you know, depending, so when you actually file, you're reporting it and then it will be validated by a trustee. Um, personally, when people look at this, there's a number of ways that people will assess it. But you know, now if I was trying to figure out my home equity, I'd, I'd try and either use like Zillow or find comps to kind of get a sense relative to it. So there could be heterogeneity. Um, there is a very nice paper forthcoming in the Journal of Legal Studies that seems to suggest that people are, are pretty cleanly um, assessing it, but I'm sure there's measurement error in it. I mean, just to say, there's an entire literature specifically just about how to value homes, and so homes are very heterogeneous assets. It's so difficult already to kind of know exactly um, what your home value is. It means, sorry, a follow-up question, but it means I have some uncertainty when I file for bankruptcy how my house will be assessed and how much I will have to take out in inequity out of my house to contribute yeah, to yeah. unsecured debt. Yeah, even before, to Adrian's point, like if you're thinking about, will someone come after me for it, or am I protected? There's definitely going to be some amount of uncertainty. I think that, that that's accurate. Thanks. No, that's and that's really interesting to think about the extent to which um, there might be, say, heterogeneity and the uh, way in which the trustee might value your your house and 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 uh, how that interacts with your decision. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, okay, so so we have the, the this uh, big um, dispersion in in homestead um, exemption um, levels, uh, and um, and so this is the heterogeneity that we're going to exploit to think about uh, what happened uh, during the Great Recession. Right. 
so the data that we use is a combination of uh, credit, consumer credit data uh, from the Equifax uh, consumer credit panel, um, and, um, and which we're going to aggregate to the county by quarter level, and the uh, quality census of employment and wages, which gives us employment in a disaggregated way. And then we're going to aggregate that into uh, non-tradable and tradable employment uh, following uh, the, um, the classification that Mian and Sufi introduced, and uh, which is standard in this literature. Um, and so let me provide you with just the first cut of the data. Okay, so one thing that you can do that's very simple and just plain, it's essentially plotting the raw data, is you can look at the, the classify states, look at the distribution of home exemptions, uh, homestead exemptions, and then classify states into terse sides. Um, so um, bottom terse side includes Maryland, top terse side includes Texas. Um, and then let's look at charge offs over time uh, in. Uh, the bottom uh, versus the top tier side of states. Right? And so what you can see here is that the, those states uh, with higher exemptions uh, saw significantly more charge-offs. Uh, we see this in the raw data uh, relative to states with low, exempt, uh, with low exemptions. Now, so that seems like there's a macroeconomic response in the sense that uh, there was more charge-offs in those higher exemption states. Now, how about um, employment performance, which is our main uh, object of interest? So the pretrends here look uh, very good in the sense that it doesn't look on the non-tradable non employment uh, or on tradable employment that there was any differential trend on average between the top and the bottom tier side. However, starting in the Great Recession, there's a gap that opens up. Um, and the states uh, with higher exemptions uh, perform better in terms of employment. And here you see it's the full point of employment higher um, uh, that's uh, highly persistent. So in that's our first piece of evidence. In those yes. two graphs, well, what is on the vertical axis? Oh, here it's just log. It's just 100 times log. Right? So this is normalized uh, to uh, 2006 uh, to be the same level. Uh, uh -huh. and, and so here we're just looking at the level and of- the, And the preceding graph, the charge off, what is it? So here this was, um, yeah, sorry for not labeling the axis. Uh, this is the uh, amount per person, dollars per person, in so charge uh, So it's not in relation to the size of the loan, no. Uh, no, this is at the. This is aggregated to the. Remember, um, to the. In the simplest case, it's aggregated to the state level, right? And then we say, well, right, how this is per per person. Ah, per, per, person. Size, per person in those states, exactly. Not per loan. Per person. Per person. Okay, fine. okay. That's right. exactly, and that's important for us because we want to understand in terms of thinking about the magnitudes, right? It's the extent, the total amount of charge-offs that was done, you know, uh, and we're going to scale that um, by number of people, yeah. and, and 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 ultimately we're interested in scaling that by something like a flow measure of say GDP, right? and I'll, I'll show you how we we do the scaling a bit later. But, but yeah, it might be informative to have it as a fraction of the total loans or unsecured loans? No, I mean, that's another way of doing the scaling, uh, absolutely. Uh, what I'll show you in the, in the model is that we, what we care about is the total amount, say, relative to GDP, because um, uh, that's the simplest way to do the aggregation, you know, because for any loan that's given, someone uh, is, um, so for any uh, loan that's gi given to a debtor, there's a creditor on the other side. And if you want to understand what's the total amount of loans that's, uh, that's around, the easiest thing is to just normalize by GDP. Uh, that's, so that's going to be our main normalization in the model. Um. Oh, Adrian, another question. So this is, a, this is a loss for the banks, right? This is a loss for someone, yes. I mean, the, the immediate... Uh, the, 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 the immediate person that's hit, if you want, or the immediate entity that's hit is the bank, and then the bank presumably adjusts on some margin. Um, so uh, there is like a redistribution sort of, of resources, because in some way you think if it's a national bank, basically there is no effects on financial stability of anything of the sort, right? Mm -hmm. Because there could be another effect in, in that sense. It's like you-, Absolutely. you yeah. yeah. So no, I mean, it's just redistribution in some way across regions if you think that most banks are national. 
I mean, at this stage, I'm just documenting some facts. So okay. uh, then later, I'll tell you about the, the interpretation. So in the interpretation, we'll think banks are national and the extent to which they reduce credit supply, they will do that uniformly across regions. Right? Okay. So that effect would be different stats. Okay. Exactly. So, so it's, so, um, the, and that's, I'm, I'm going to show you in reduced form how we model this, but the, yeah, the, think of it as, you know, it goes to, there's high and low exemption states and uh, the loss is taken by the bank and then the bank adjusts on some margin, but it's not a margin that's local to the state. It could be okay. uh, somewhere else. Okay. Um, and um, yes. But if I can ask a follow-up question on that, so then, I mean, so would you say that uh, states with different laws, with vi I mean, the variation in laws is uh, uncorrelated with uh, some distributional features of the population by state? For instance, I don't know, like the share of wealthy hand to mouth by state before the crisis, is it orthogonal to the, to the, vari to the size of the exemption? Because otherwise you could say that then maybe there's more no, that's, demand. I mean, yeah, so, so, um... That's actually a, an interesting su suggestion. So we look at various covariates, uh, but you're right that um, one the one that connects well with our model is um, is the the share of hand to mouth, uh, and so which we could compute in the microdata, and then we could look at the extent to which it's correlated with our exemption measures. And my guess, just from all of the other covariates that we've looked at, uh, that there doesn't look to be significant correlations. It's uh, and and but the hand to mouth share is like a very nice one because it's a, mm -hmm. a one that's nicely connected to our model. And so that's that's a very nice suggestion. Yeah, we can look at this. Um, okay, so this is so this is this kind of headline result that we're gonna uh, see in more uh, de detail and uh, you know uh, uh, precision later uh, about this really uh, like this better non tradable employment performance. Right? And when we're looking at tradable employment, on the other hand. Uh, we don't see much of an effect, right? And so it looks like um, something that looks like a demand shock, essentially. You know, there was a lot of charge-offs in those states. Uh, Non-tradable employment went up. Uh, tradable employment didn't go up differentially. And now we want to think about uh, what that means in the context of a model, uh, right? Because there's clearly something that's being differentiated out when we're thinking about tradable employment because you can always buy goods uh, from any state. Um, and so it's a zero effect doesn't mean anything about the, what the level might be. Um, so let me briefly walk through the this research design, which is just uh, looking at those graphs um, with uh, kind of more econometrics and uh, thinking about the, the variation um, in, in more detail. Um, but um, essentially is, um, you know, is capturing uh, what, what I just showed you in uh, just looking at this top and bottom of the side, right? So when a document, uh, the responses of uh, both at our outcomes, uh, so charge-offs, uh, employment, and tradable and non-tradable, um, using the simple regression specification, where in any location, which uh, you can think of as just doing it done at the state level, um, we regress the outcome on a state fixed effect, a time fixed effect, and then a full set of interactions uh, between uh, time and the level of protection, right? so the level of home exemptions. Right? So that's the standard uh, uh, kind of a regression setup in the literature, uh, which is like a fancy version of different difference in differences. Um, and we're going to run this separately for non-tradable and tradable employment. All right, so the way you want to think about uh, the identifying assumptions here is uh, the first assumption is that in the absence of the Great Recession, we, we'd have seen states evolve in parallel. Right? And we can partially test for this looking at pre-trends, a little bit like I've been uh, doing so far. Um, the second is that the divergence in trends after the Great Recession is only due to the difference in protections. Of course, that's harder to test. And so this is where we can do uh, various examinations of correlates with the protection measures. And, and so these confounders, next I'll just mention hand to mass share as a, a potential other one that we can uh, look, at, look at there. Um, and uh, we can also uh, look at you know, controlling for potential alternative channels directly in the regression. And that's another way of partially testing for the second assumption. Right? A key limitation in what we do, uh, which is uh, common across all this literature, is that we're differencing out key general equilibrium effects. And so this is why the model is going to be helpful. Um, we want, so we're going to get a different diff estimate, and then it, that doesn't tell us how low and high protection states are separately affected. It just tells us the difference between the two. We need a model to, re to, uh, to, to recover the, the level. 
Okay, so these are the results. So um, um, on charge loss per capita, uh, you know, with standard errors, uh, we see an average charge off uh, of around 45. Uh, so this is again dollars per person, right? And um, in um, in um, in this regression, um, and a persistent effect on non-tradable employment uh, with an average effect of about 67. So uh, points of employment. Um, in the short run, and then it continues and only seems to die off after a while. So it's like a very persistent effect. Um, we're going to be focused on the short run because we think that's what the model is best able to speak to. The long run is, uh, is something that we're still grappling with. You know, how come there is so much persistence in the effect? And this is not unique to our paper. There's lots of papers that have shown that there appears to be you know, long run effects of uh, uh, short, short run shocks uh, in the in the wake of a recession, um, and uh, and so there's various mechanisms that one can think about for how these short run effects can get propagated, but they're not going to be in our in our model. Um, tradable employment, uh, we see a, we see essentially a zero response. Um, it, it's uh, you know the point estimate is somewhat negative, but with large standard errors. Okay, so. What we are going to think about is, is these estimates as the causal impact of these bankruptcy protections. Uh, but the object of interest from our perspective is the response of employment to debt relief. That's what the model uh, speaks to. Uh, when there is debt relief in a region, how does that affect employment? Um, now, in order to do this, we're going to proxy for debt relief using the flow of charge-offs that we observe. Uh, but we know that the charge-offs that we observe do not contain all of the debt relief that there is. You know, and in particular, here, there's a list here of uh, things that are missing, medical debt, pay the credit, uh, write-offs that are not captured in the, your credit report, uh, renegotiations in the terms, and so on. Um, so we do our best uh, looking at actual bankruptcy filings uh, to see how much is missing. And uh, that provides us with a way of scaling uh, the number that I gave you, say the $50 per person, um, up um, to try to reflect the, the missing charge-offs, right? The ones that we don't observe. Um, so that's the first step in order to try to get at the full macroeconomic uh, amount of debt relief that there is. And then the second step is we're going to construct this object that has this model counterpart, uh, uh, which is the what we'll call the relative uh, employment multiplier uh, uh, separately for non-tradables and tradables. Right? So that's the effect on employment from our regressions, divided by the effect, uh, by the amount of write downs. Uh, and, and to Jill's question, here we're gonna normalize uh, by, the, by the macro uh, variable of interest of the model, which is consumption, aggregate consumption. Yeah. And so, you know, in full disclosure, this is a, this is a revision of a paper uh, where we, um, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on the empirical side, uh, following suggestions of the editor, going back you know, further and looking at various measures of the instrument and um, we, um, uh, so we, we now have these new empirical estimates uh, that are uh, larger in magnitude than when, what we used to have. And so we're still grappling with this because the model, as it's currently set up, actually cannot justify such large multipliers. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about um, qualitatively what the model uh, tells us for now. And then we're, you know, we're in version two of the empirical results. Uh, haven't quite converged on the um, on, on the version two of the calibrated model. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll show you the old calibration of the model, what it implies uh, for our, our new empirical estimates, and I'll provide you with a with a new counterfactual. All right, so we're gonna so we have um, employment multipliers on non-tradables that are of the order of you know two to almost four in the new version, and on tradables. It's, uh, as you saw, uh, essentially an, uh, an imprecisely estimated uh, zero. Right. Um, so how do we want to think about uh, these large non-tradable employment multipliers and these essentially zero uh, tradable employment multipliers? So this is why a structural model is useful. Um, so the way we build the structural model, is, um, it's, it's a, as I said, a, a tank cube model. So it, a currency union model with incomplete. Sorry, Adrian, can you say a bit more on the? Can you go back to the to the yeah. multiplier slide? Yes. So how tightly is this estimate, or how should I think about? Yeah. So the well, you should think that the standard errors are large. So we're not actually setting it up formally as an IV, although you could in principle. Yeah. 
Um, and, um, you know, the, so the, the, the way we think about it is, you know, summarizing the point estimate now, um, because, you know, our standard errors are very large, right? But, but we have a tightly uh, estimated effect on non-tradable employment. So here, we're fairly confident that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large magnitude. So the reason why we're not form formally setting it up that way is, you see, we have a precisely estimated, uh, a precisely estimated uh, employment effect, um, but we have a somewhat imprecisely estimated yeah. charge-off effect. I see. And then we're uncertain about the extent to which these charge-offs translate into total amount of debt relief, because there's this additional step that we're not measuring everything in the data, right? And so the, 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 now the, so the, so the way you want to think about, say, this number of four is, um, well, um, it's um, the way, when, once we scale up these average effects, we get about 0.2% of GDP per standard deviation increase in the instrument on um, on debt relief um, and we get uh, a little bit about 0.6 percent in employment and so that's 0.67 divided by 0.2 uh, mm -hmm. so it's about you know it's a, it's a little bit higher than three mm -hmm. um, but we um, we don't formally set it up as an IV uh, for, for these reasons that there's all this uncertainty that's not sampling uncertainty uh, that that we have and what we prefer to do at this stage is just think of it as summary measures of uh, mm -hmm. the, the magnitude um, in order to be able to contrast them with the model, um, but with the understanding that there is a large standard errors, right? And so uh, that's mm -hmm. the, another reason uh, for um, you know, not, not going more precisely into how much the, the model can exactly kind of try to match the empirical estimates. They're, they're too imprecisely estimated. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, thanks Al, for the question. Um, okay, so um, okay, so this is the structural model. It's a uh, it's uh, um, a tank. I like to call it tank cube, right? So two agents, uh, two regions, and two goods. Uh, so it's a currency union model with this heterogeneity and marginal propensities to consume. So we have high and low exemption regions. Um, we have tradable and non-tradable goods, which is going to speak to our. Uh, uh, to our empirical um, facts about uh, employment in those uh, in those industries, and then two agents who are going to have a, a fraction of, uh, phi of borrowers and a fraction of minus phi of savers. Um, now, agents have the same period utility function of aggregate consumption and labor, uh, but they have different discount factors. Uh, that's going to microfound why um, borrowers uh, are bo in fact borrowers in equilibrium. Uh, and savers uh, are on the other side. Um, production is subject to diminishing returns uh, on, in both the tradable and non-tradable sector. And we have sticky uh, capital prices in each sector, uh, which we're modeling in the standard way. Uh, and there's a probability of a fixed price of theta per quarter. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, what, how the model, the model predictions depending on theta. So this nests flexible prices uh, and we'll, uh, flexible wages. And so here is how we're modeling these debt relief shocks. So we're doing a lump sum redistribution from savers to borrowers in the home region. So this is to Facundo's question. You know, here we don't have a banking system formally modeled. We say ultimately the, the hit that's um, to the banks uh, is being uh, passed through to the savers. Uh, and so we'll just model the savers, right? Um, however, we're going to allow for the possibility that the debt relief exogenously reduces credit supply uh, in the next period, uh, but this is going to be done in a uniform way across regions. So and that's the most important because it's going to get different than. Um, the, um, and, and further, we're allowing for possibility that either the local savers or the, the foreign savers are paying for the debt relief. The, the, the key that buys us tractability, and that's why it's not a full structural model, and we can't really speak to the ex-ante effects uh, in the context of the model, is that the redistribution itself is unexpected. So it's not affecting interest rates or borrowing ex-ante. Right? Uh, and so there's this uh, reduced form credit supply shock um, that, um, that helps us think about uh, what the, the, the effect of a reduction in credit supply might be, but we're not connecting that um, in the model. And uh, monetary policy is at the zero lower bound uh, with the standard equilibrium selection. Okay, so. So, uh, Adrian, can I ask you? I don't know, because I was thinking during your talk all the time about 
Uh, your, your picking on this mechanism, that is that you give more money to the poor people, and then it's all demand effect, right? Uh, but I was thinking, could it be that there is a, a wealth effect through the housing prices? Because now, you know, the houses are more protected in certain states, so you would expect a lower fall in the prices. Uh, and then maybe that also has a, 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 you know, an expansionary effect in the state. But you, 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 you basically are assuming that everything comes through the, to this redistribution effect. So in, I don't know if in your version, in your version two of the model, you do something like that, or you have some empirics to say that the, this wealth effect or ha through housing prices, for instance, is, is not relevant. Right, so we've studied the effects on the housing prices, and Paul, you can you know jump in and uh, remind me how this um, this pans out. But I, my recollection is that there the there wasn't a reason to think that the the wealth effect from housing price changes observed empirically was um, going to give us some bites. But now, now, now you're making me think maybe we can try to leverage that. Um, Adrian, I, I just a related comment. Um, I would have thought that the there's an ex ante effect that you're abstracting from, which is totally reasonable, which is the effect on who I want to where where capital flows. Right. Right. So so that's I, I don't know how you get your head around that. But well, I mean, so let me tell you how we do that. So the the more com the one the Facundo's question is is uh, it's harder for me to deal with right now because I, I need to go back and see what are the estimated effects on house prices and could it be that there is an effect from the from the house prices right uh, now so so the the effects on credit supply here we're going to model in this very reduced form way right so we'll say this so look at bu budget constraints so the way we model that relief is we say coming in you have a certain amount of debt, and we're gonna reduce that debt by this delta. And that's going to be an unexpected transfer coming in. Now, in addition, it could be that the borrowing constraint gets reduced tomorrow, right? So for going out. So for the amount of credit that you can get tomorrow. The, the key here is that the reduction in this Xi, it's uniform across states. It doesn't depend on the age. Uh, or, or on the I, on the region, whereas the, um, the, the redistribution, it does depend on the I. Now, in the model with commitment that I have, there is a, there's a structural link between the two because expectations of reductions in credit supply tomorrow, uh, of uh, redistribution tomorrow, reduce credit supply today, right? So if lenders know uh, that the, 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 the debt will be written off tomorrow, that reduces credit supply today. And so there's a structural link between Xi T and Delta T plus one uh, that's induced by the model. Uh, now, the reason why we don't do this here is because one, it would substantially complicate the model, but two, you know, this is short-term debt and uh, a lot of the debt is, is not short-term in the data. So it's uh, much more complicated in practice. There's only a fraction of debt that's being rolled over. And so the, the the, the the links between the you know the red and the blue are are very complex in practice and require kind of moving to a full structural model uh, that we we didn't want to do for this paper. Um, but I mean that's an excellent question and that's something I'm I'm working on with Kurt now. Does that answer your question, Marty? Yeah, I mean it's a hard problem. So it's it seems like the right abstraction for now. You're really looking at the distribution of the short run stimulus effects and taking that other stuff as given seems reasonable. Taking, taking it as a given. Now, of course, so we have something to say about it, which is, you know, if we, the way we model it now with this um, uniform um, effect of reduction in credit supply, it's going to get absorbed in the regression. So let me, let me tell you, so just briefly closing on the model, right? So these are the budget constraints, which is the key thing. Uh, then all markets are clearing. So total employment is the sum of tradable and non-tradable employment. Non-tradable goods need to be consumed locally. And then all debts, um, you know, borrower's debts are uh, savers' assets. So whenever there is a reduction in incoming um, debt relief, right? Whenever there's incoming debt relief, uh, savers need to take the hit, and we can allocate that to foreign uh, savers or, or home savers. Okay. So 
the way to think about uh, what the results I'm going to present to you are is simple because this is a model that's symmetric um, in the sense that the two regions have the uh, same size and there's the same fraction. Everything is symmetric within a region. And we have all these shocks that are common. So tradable employment, uh, tradable TFP, non-tradable TFP, uh, non-tradable productivity, and credit supply shocks. So all of these shocks are hitting the model symmetrically. And uh, now you can think the home region receives this uh, treatment that's special to it. Um, it's this uh, debt relief for the home region. And then there could be a treatment of the foreign region too, uh, in general. Because the model is symmetric and linear, uh, approximately, we can write um, any outcome like unemployment as something that looks like our regression. Uh, but now this is the true causal effect in the model. So the effect on, say, employment in the model is level effect in the region plus any time trend. And this time trend is uh, all of these shocks here are absorbed by the time trend. And then there is two, ca two causal effects that are of interest to us. There is the MH, which is if I do debt relief in the home region, how does that affect home outcome? And then there's the MF, which is if I do debt relief in the foreign region, how does that affect home outcome? And in the model, because everything is connected via tradable goods and via common monetary and fiscal policy and so on, um, the, uh, there's no reason to presume that the MF will be zero. And so what we're using the model for is recovering uh, separately MH and MF from any given estimate of, M, uh, from, uh, of the relative. Okay, so what is the relative, the definitive estimator? It's the difference between MH and MF, that's what we measure. What is the thing that we care about is uh, the overall effect of debt relief. That's going to be the sum of MH and MF, net of any effect on credit supply, right? And so this is where, you know, the causal effect that we care about, it's what would happen if you just did debt relief, net of any effect that comes from the fact that you, um, that, that credit supply might be reduced. Right? So for today, uh, we're going to assume that lambda c is zero. And so right now we're thinking about either obtaining lambda c from outside estimates or using my structural model with Mitman uh, to uh, pin this down. Um, and, and so when I do lambda c equals zero, think of the, the, the numbers I show you as an upper bound on the overall causal effect because we don't have the effect on the reduction in credit supply. Okay, so let me, uh, as I said, it's uh, still kind of version, it's version you know, 2A of the model. So um, I'll show you the calibrated model from, from before um, and, um, and, and some kind of factuals. But let me tell you four lessons that, that are general that are not dependent on the specific numbers. So the first one is that in order to be able to match this high non-tradable effect uh, together with a low relative tradable effect, we need high aggregate price stickiness. So in this model, uh, that's the only way uh, we can do it. The second is that it, given this high aggregate price stickiness, the fact that there's zero tradable multiplier in the relative sense masks a large positive effect in both regions. And so even though you're not observing a differential effect on tradable employment, uh, in fact, um, you actually have high positive effects in both regions that are being differenced out. The third is that at the zero lower bound, which is our main case for this period, the non-tradable employment response in the low exemption regions is positive. So there is positive spillovers, uh, and that's via tradable demand uh, that spills over into non-tradable employment. And the final one is that the, the, the employment uh, uh, multiplier is, is large in the model because the shock is small. So there's a lot of, there's interesting non-linearities. If we made the shock a lot larger, uh, we would have seen uh, lower uh, multipliers. Okay, so in the interest of time, just let, let me go very briefly. So this plots, as a function of the degree of price rigidity, the relative multiplier, the foreign and the home multiplier. So as I was saying, we can match, um, you, you know, in order to match a high debt relief multiplier, and remember our number is three right now, so we're, we're far from that uh, currently, but we need a high degree of price rigidity. That's the only thing that can explain uh, the large uh, non-tradable uh, uh, response. Also, um, if uh, prices are too flexible, the relative employment multiplier is negative, and that's because of the wealth effect, but coming from labor supply. Um, so if you make prices too flexible, um, that relief actually um, 
induces those who receive the debt relief that are have high MPCs, they also uh, have propensities to take leisure. And so they actually reduce employment and, and, and so things go the wrong way. Um, in terms of the role of monetary policy, so as I said, if you, um, so, so one observation in this model is that the, the level effect of monetary policy is different stat. Um, but, and so we can look at the, uh, the model as a function of the response to inflation in the Taylor rule. And if we're at zero, which is the zero lower bound, we get high uh, multipliers on both non-tradables and tradable, uh, on, on, sorry, on the home and the foreign regions and for both uh, tradables and non-tradables. Um, let me uh, skip the, the size counterfactual uh, for a minute in order to be, um, have time for our main counterfactual. So this is the, the main uh, question that we're gonna ask with this model. So our question of interest is, what if exemptions had been high everywhere before the Great Recession. And so instead of having all this heterogeneity, let us assume that exemptions were a lot higher. So how much higher? We'll say, let's assume that we bring in, on average, all states to the level of the top tier size of states. And so remember this initial picture that I showed you where in the top tier size of states, relative to the bottom tier side, there was a lot more charge-offs. Let's assume that charge-offs in the low exemption states would have been as high as in the high exemption states. Right, which is reasonable to presume. It's just saying the, all these betters are more, now more protected, they would have charged off more unsecured debt. And let's consider our baseline calibration of the model with zero credit supply response. So that's gonna provide an upper bound. Let's use the model to infer the counterfactual employment path under these alternative exemption laws. So um, I'm gonna look at the actual outcome and then the counterfactual. Right? So this is, how much we're inferring from the charge of data would have been the additional charge offs in the low exemption states. And then filtering through the model, these were the employment outcomes that I showed you initially. These are in, in dashed, the counterfactual non-tradable and tradable employment outcomes that we would have observed using the structure of the model fed in with these additional charge offs. And so what you see is reflecting this property of the model that when you're increasing charge-offs, um, you are increasing um, so debt relief in low exemption regions. And so those low exemption regions see more employment, uh, but there's also a spillover effect, with, although minor, on high exemption regions. And when we're thinking about tradable employment effects, there, there is a positive effect on both and that, that's lifting, uh, lifting up both regions. Now, the exact magnitudes of these lines, of course, they depend on the multiplier that we use. So in our model, the multiplier is lower than in the data. And so those lines are uh, currently giving us a, a, an effect like 0.2% of employment. Um, now, of course, if we brought the multiplier in the model in line with what we observe in the data, we'd observe uh, much larger effects. And so that's kind of what the, the work in progress is now, figuring out exactly what the, the right multiplier is to use in order to be able to conduct this kind of factual. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, we were finding this reduced form evidence that those more generous uh, states uh, saw more charge-offs and higher non-tradable employment relative to the other states. And we're uh, calculating a debt relief multiplier uh, that's on the order of a two or more for non-tradables at about zero for tradables. Right? So in order to rationalize this, we need substantial nominal rigidities. And given that, uh, our model is suggesting uh, that uh, low exemption regions also benefited uh, at the zero lower bound. Uh, and so ag these aggregate demand effects are important in evaluating uh, debt relief policy in general. Uh, and so that's part of our, this broader agenda uh, in this paper with Kurt Mittman, where we're thinking about this in the context of a full structural model with nominal rigidities and credit supply effects, um, where we can evaluate the extent to which recession contingent debt relief might be optimal. So think about bankruptcy rules, where saying recession uh, you decide uh, to, um, low, to, uh, to, to, to provide more debt relief, how much would that stabilize the business cycle? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so now we have uh, 10 minutes for open discussion. I think Giancarlo had a question and maybe uh, now you can talk to Giancarlo if I understand correctly, so. Yeah, I, I can unmute myself. Can you hear me? 
Yes. I no, just I, I just I I I was just, I, I just uh, uh, intrigued. I, I have read the paper. The non the tradable balls. Those are substitutable, right? You you have like a rigidities there, so uh, you, you don't have the low one price there, right? No. Well, so for tradables, we do. Uh, because there's no uh, home bias in tradable, so you consume. But, but you, you, you have nominal rigidities there. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so nominal rigidities would be different, different state. No, you will also uh, respond to demand. So in principle, you could have a, a little bit of an additional layer of uh, testable implication about uh, relative price or tradable. Which, by uh, the way, that's right. And and we uh, we test those implications. You mean for inflation, for tradable inflation versus yeah, tradable inflation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we look in the data, but you know, as you might expect, the prices are fairly sticky in the data, so we don't actually see much effect at all on uh, any uh, on inflation for tradable goods or non-tradable goods. Because we we, we look at trades, we have all this uh, paper stuck at the LBS. We are look at sectoral very. And I don't remember, but there is some, and also you have wages, wage differential in, pre, in, in principle, no? You, you, could, you, could, you, could, you could bring in. Across regions for wages, but you're right. Wages, the the to, wages are on our list of things to look at. So the, that's, yeah, that one we haven't done. The prices one is one that we've done using basically the differences across MSAs that's available in the United States and trying to sort of map to the same tradable non. No, this is what we exactly what, what we did a little bit. So there is my, you know, could be interesting to see, you know, rather than just assuming low on price, there could be dif differences here and there. Are you thinking, yeah. uh, so so the law of one price holds like good by good, right? It just doesn't hold on average because of these prices. Not the same, you know, if you have price rigidity, it's the way you, you model that cannot be. So there must be tradable, there's some degree of substitutability across borders, right? So there must be a little bit what we call international terms of trade movement. Doesn't matter. I mean, rather the price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, be, there's that are affected. Of trade movements that play a role. They play a big role in the uh, flexible price version of the model, but mm. even in the, you know, in the sticky price uh, version of the model. Uh, at the margin, I think uh, there, there could be some movement. I'm just curious to see mm -hmm. it. Like yeah, wages I mean, are more are more difficult. I mean, because of data, but otherwise wages would be the next thing to look. That's right. No, and uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've been uh, thinking about the, those price implications of the model, but, it, uh, you know, it's, it, is, it is an empirical fact that if you're looking at inflation, you know, during the Great Recession, it's really hard to detect any effect. Uh, and so right. and that's, a, that's indirect support for nominal rigidities, of course, but not direct. So I have a, I have a question. Um, so this is very interesting. So from the um, that overhang literature, I'm thinking more than from the international perspective, mm -hmm. it's sort of understood that when there's investment opportunities, that's when that overhang problems can become really severe, and hence sort of debt relief policies could be very beneficial. So if you think about from the point of view of consumption, uh, you know, if you if you think about durable consumption, for example, that that would sort of play a similar role. So you know, thinking about the context of the model, if, you know, there's a way to maybe change preferences so that it looks more like an investment, good, uh, you know, some sake with durables, then I think that you could get a really bigger, kick, much bigger kick in terms of the, the, the overhang because uh, of these uh, sort of uh, investment type consumption that, uh, you know, you're going to be, it's going to be very, very responsive to the debt overhang. No, that's, that's Anyways, an excellent question. I mean, you're right. So, um, so that's one direction to go, you know, which is if we want to match, we say these are final, are our final, you know, estimates on on multipliers, and they're very large. Uh, how do we grapple with this? Well, one option. There's multiple options that we've explored, including changing preferences, so adding complementarities between consumption and brand preferences. One way would be thinking about um, a model with with durable spending, and um, you know, it, it, that, that alone. Um, raises marginal propensity to spend overall on expenditure, right? And then on top of that, you might have those uh, interesting debt overhang effects that um, might give us an extra kick, right? So th those, this is, right now, it's still a little bit open. Um, and so all these suggestions are super welcome. Just thinking about what, um, what can I put into the model that will, um, that, that will raise the, the level of, uh, of uh, overall um, kind of multipliers that we were observing in a, in the data to the level we we're observing in the data. Adrian, I, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, go, 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 Mark. Okay. Uh, no, I just had a, um, a question about the, uh, the big picture a little bit, which is, you didn't mention the following. So, so we know that 
I guess from Ian and Sufi and just stylized facts that areas that had bigger boom bus had longer bus in the non-tradable sector. Right. So I think that's pretty uncontroversial. But right. then the question becomes, is there some correlation between the debt relief states where it was high or low mm -hmm. and where you had boom busts? So a very different mechanism that could be consistent with the big picture empirical result you had was you said, well, debt relief is high implies that we had good non-tradable employment, relatively speaking. There's yeah, relative no to other places, exactly. I mean, the, 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 the key is, you know, think of it as like an automatic stabilizer. It, um, right. It's hard to detect because if the place goes down by more, you know, there will be more charge offs. And the question is, absent this additional mechanism, absent this automatic stabilizer, how much worse would the performance have been? No, no, for sure. But in the empirical work, do you control for the boom bust cycle in housing? Yeah, just, so to be consistent with this, Martin, just so like, I, like, I think it's very straightforward is like the Mian and Sufi stuff is predicated on thinking about the supply elasticity of these different MSA and counties. And we sort of have a bunch of our set of results are just saying, let's hold thick, let's control for that in a time varying way and see if our results still hold. So. You know, I don't love like kind of throwing every potential control confounder in as like um, we'd rather have it be straightforward. But yeah, we do a lot of our results. We do the same thing where we say, let's just hold fixed the elasticity of these places and see. And our results kind of look very similar. Um, but is, is there some correlation between just uh, and then I'll stop. Is there a correlation between debt relief, high debt relief states and the extent of the housing boom bus? So the house price appreciation, um, my recollection is no, but it's definitely in our, I'm just looking. Um, so that'd be very cool. I, it seems to me that's actually very cool because that makes your result much stronger. Right. Yeah. So the house prices, the, the, the house price appreciation in these places, there was, we should have the delta. I don't actually have the delta here, but it's not really that correlated with it. We still try and control for it because you might be worried about some other things like one thing in the Mian and Sufi literature is kind of there's this differential between the boom versus the bust, like the run-up versus the decline. Sure. Sure. Empirically, it's a little hard, but we should have a couple more things to kind of pull. Yeah, there you go. So mm -hmm. Adrian put it up on there and like, right. this is the relative prices. Some of this is noise, though. There's so much variation in the boom. And another thing to keep in mind here is that the, a lot of the price variation is kind of even within states variation that me and Sufi were exploiting. So if you think about the difference between like LA and San Francisco or San Diego and San Francisco. And so then it's a little bit, I, I, you know, part of the reason there's so much noise here is it's capturing some of that element that like cross state variation is a little bit different than within state variation. Absolutely. But okay. I do think of, I mean, I think we're thinking of this as an independent channel above and beyond the house price one. That being said, the house price one is obviously first order in this crisis. Yeah. So you we should think of it maybe according to Facundo's suggestion, maybe there is a, a way to bring that back into the model without making it blow up. <laughs> I don't know if you have to do it in the model. I mean, it just, for me, it would be nice if you just have, and again, you have enough editors and referees, but it would be nice in the empirical work just to say, yeah, we thought about this and here's how it cuts relative to that. Absolutely. Thanks, Martin. If I may, uh if, if I may add something, I am um, sure you are familiar with Gina Coppola's uh, proposal, both uh, in the US and then later in the EU, the idea of uh, basically providing relief to people with uh, just negative equity. So he, he, had, he was very vocal already uh, early on during the crisis, uh, basically count, counteracting the idea that there would be more hazard in this debt relief by saying, look, if you just give that relief to people, at the margin. So, so I wonder whether uh, this could be a good framework to, to estimate the aggregate effect of those proposals that were turned down both in the US and then later on in Greece. Uh, so the, the negative idea, home equity, right? So yeah, if you yeah, basically the, local, the, the average treatment effect that we have, because we're looking at yeah. people that actually have positive equity, those are the yeah, people yeah. that are relevant for us. They're, you know, if you think that there was like something very fundamentally different about the MPC of the guys with positive home equity versus negative home equity, we couldn't directly evaluate this. Um, well, I just wonder whether from 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 your you know, for the next project, it looks like mm -hmm. you know you have the setup that could be brought to this uh, to evaluate those proposals. 
John, John G. I, I had in mind the general equilibrium effect very clearly, you know, saying that, you know, like if you no, have no, done it on, on a large scale, the, then those people magically become, you know, basically they turn. I, uh, I, I do not remember the detail of the, of the proposal. That's it. No, thanks a lot. Yeah. If I can, okay, I'm going to ask the last question. It's a bit naive, but in your empirical work, you split U.S. states in two, right? Um, well, so two groups. We, we do various, uh, you know, various splits. Uh, but the one that I showed you is th there's three terse size, and we're looking at the bottom versus the top. The, right. The, 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 but basically, the you look at the evolution, uh, the, the evolution of non-traded employment between the two groups, right? That's but right. I would think that the states that have different uh, debt relief provisions also differ from the others by many variables, no? So how can sure, I? Yeah, yeah. This is what this is what this whole okay. discussion that I went quickly over yeah. on confounders is about. So we are. We're, in the paper, we try to make a compelling case that the other, of course, states are different in many different ways, right? but once you pull them according to this um, measure, they're not looking observably different on uh, dimensions that you might think are confounding our uh, a causal effect um, estimate. Right? For so, example, did you check for differences in, uh, I don't know, local uh, stimulus policies? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we, we do have measures of, uh, you know, um, generosity, say, of uh, the state in other dimensions, mm -hmm. like say, unemployment insurance uh, benefits, so th things that might be local stabilizers that are at the state mm -hmm. level more generous than some versus other states. Um, so that's not uh, a, a direct problem. You know, of course, that's not to say this is perfect and we got the holy grail of the causal estimates, right? And this is just, I think, uh, suggested mm -hmm. important evidence that it looks like those states that uh, were more generous also in terms of debt relief also perform better and, uh, and that, that there's something that, that's likely causal there. Okay. Just as a follow-up, they should differ systematically in the response of unsecured credit supply to movements in house prices, right? So there's a potential thing that might. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, because house prices move, then the extension becomes more relevant or less relevant. Um, and that effect is, differs between those two groups of states. And that you would not be able to differentiate out from your debt relief, that differential debt relief effects, right? I try to, yeah, so if there's a feedback related to Facundo's question, right? If there's a feedback from, uh, you know, via the exemptions itself, you know, to the debt, to the home prices, and then those in turn um, have, uh, say, wealth effects, you know, consequences, then uh, that's something that would be part of the mechanism. You know, it would be, you know, one way to think about it is it would just be, then that is part of the causal effect of these different exemptions, you know, and it would be part of the mechanism. So we could model that. We could throw, in, throw it into the model. No, but, but even if house prices move exactly the same and the wealth effects are exactly the same, credit supply, unsecured credit rights would react differently, right? Because of the different yeah, this exemptions. Is, this is to I your guess, work guess with Kurt, and this is to your work with Kurt. And also, I mean, other, Eduardo Davia also has some work where he's been trying to think about this in the sense of thinking about like, the optimal exemption and what's the elasticity of interest rates with respect to these exemptions, which I think is consistent with your question a little bit. Um, but at adding in this house price dimension, he's just sort of thinking about the changes in the laws themselves. And you're saying, well, we should think about the distribution of the people with respect to the laws. Um, I think that- But it's, it's not directly clear that the, if the interest rates on m mortgages uh, would um, be related to the level of uh, home exemptions, right? Because the mortgages are secured. I mean, I think, remember this is unsecured debt. So the, the question is how, what's the you know through this mechanism you know that you have higher exemptions in some states and not others how would that affect differentially the interest rates or the credit the supply of credit on the unsecured debt you know and so that no of course of course the, the, i mean i'm not sure in how in, in how far these unsecured loans condition on your idiosyncratic characteristics but on average if you, the house price moves you You'll be a bet, perhaps a worse of a, a creditor in the mm -hmm. low exemptions. 